Good morning, good morning guys. We're back at it again with another video. Living on rainwater in the desert, can it be done? Two year update for us. So we've been living out here uh, just outside of Benson, Arizona in southern Arizona where we get around 11 or 12 inches of rain per year. And this will be our third monsoon season that we've gone through uh, with our full rainwater harvesting setup. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about how it's all constructed and all that kind of stuff because I've done so many videos talking about that, but I wanted to let you guys know that we're gonna make it another full year without any hiccups or any issues like that. And it's pretty badass to think that we get less than half of the, an the average annual rainfall uh, throughout the United States um, and we're still able to live completely on rainwater, the stuff that just falls directly from the sky. I'll show you in a little bit how much water is in our tanks, uh, but right now we have about uh, 5,000 to 5,500 gallons of water still in our water tanks and that has to last us only another couple weeks until we start getting our monsoon storms, which typically happen I mean, we've already gotten some rain. It hasn't been measurable rain or anything like that. We've just had a few uh, quick showers and stuff, uh, but there hasn't really been any rain in the bottom of my rain gauge yet. So uh, it's typically within the last few weeks of July here, so coming up right now, um, that we start getting the storms where we get, you know, half an inch, an inch, or an inch and a quarter, or an inch and a half of rain in about an hour's time. So a little bit of history. Um, originally when we moved out here, um, I, didn't, I didn't actually think that we could live on rainwater, but it was actually through the inspiration of uh, Joe from Homesteadonomics, watching a number of his videos, uh, seeing some of his ideas, and asking him some questions about living on rainwater out here, um, I thought, hey, so instead of drilling a well and tapping into the groundwater, um, which tapping into the groundwater, specifically in Tucson and probably in Phoenix, is definitely a big issue. Um, specifically in Tucson, there actually used to be a river that flowed there uh, throughout the year, but it's through the overpumping of groundwater uh, through wells that uh, the groundwater has been depleted so much that the river no longer flows anymore. And that definitely has a significant effect on basically the landscape and the wildlife and all those different factors in that area. The story that I've been told specifically about Tucson is that uh, the farmers, you know, back in the day, they actually used to be able to dig a trench from where the river was and actually flood irrigate their properties that way. So if you've been to Tucson, you'll, you'll definitely see the river system kind of throughout the city. They, they just call them washes now, but there used to be rivers that actually flowed through it, which is crazy to think because right now, um, the only time that you see flowing water throughout Tucson is when we have our monsoon storms. I'm definitely a big advocate and proponent of, uh, of living on rainwater, um, if not entirely, but at least trying to use as much rainwater as you can just through good design for irrigating your trees to grow fruit on your property or to grow native trees or just to grow crops in a standard garden bed. I'm not gonna specifically go over our system in this video because I've gone over it a number of times and I'll link to those videos and the playlist that I've created down in the description box and also in the comment section below. But there's a lot of benefits of rainwater and I think a lot of it, you know, people are not necessarily aware of. So hopefully through my videos and a lot of the projects that we do, it will encourage you to want to live on rainwater a little bit more. So one great thing about rainwater is that precipitation, so whether it is rain, snow, sleet, or hail, is naturally distilled through evaporation um, to cloud formation, and thus is one of the purest sources of water that you can get. Rainwater has about 100 times less total dissolved solids than ground or surface water, and that's specifically in Tucson. So the, the book that I'm referencing here is a book that I highly recommend whether you live in a desert climate or if you live in an area where you get 40 or 50 inches of rain per year, is Rainwater Harvesting for Dry Lands and Beyond. Um, it is authored by Brad Lancaster, who is a, a rainwater pioneer in Tucson. Um, there's also a great tour of his property in Tucson um, that Kirsten Dirksen did. So I will leave a, uh, I'll leave a link to that video as well and also to his book. Um, he's actually got a few books, but this one here I would definitely start off with um, because it is such a wealth of information, um, especially 
If you are thinking about building an off-grid homestead and you want to utilize rainwater and grey water specifically, um, the information in here will really have you thinking and probably will change the way that you design things. He tries to encompass all the different strategies, you know, passive solar design, rainwater, uh, utilizing grey water in the best way, um, and also shade trees and all that kind of stuff. There's so much good information in here and it's definitely one of my favorite books just to, you know, just to kind of pick through and pick up some new ideas. But rainwater is considered soft. So it's very soft water uh, due to the lack of calcium carbonate or magnesium in solution and is excellent for cooking, washing, and saving energy. So one thing that our neighbors always complain about because they're on well water is how hard the water is. Hard water can be very difficult on your appliances. Um, it makes it more difficult to wash soap out of your hair. It leaves kind of like a nasty film, um, especially in like dishwashers or even on in your shower or anything like that. You'll get this kind of like disgusting white film on there. With rainwater, that is something that we don't experience. And we don't really have any appliances that run on rainwater um, other than our washing machine. So we don't have a dishwasher or anything like that. And hard water is known for shortening basically the lifespan of you know, your plumbing pieces and your appliances. And also we have a water heater. So we can prolong the life of our appliances by using rainwater. Rainwater is also a natural fertilizer, so if one of your goals is to grow a lot of your own food, there's a lot of benefits of using rainwater. Rainwater contains nitrogen, which triggers the greening of plants. Rainwater contains sulfur, which is important for the formation of plant amino acids and contains beneficial microorganisms and mineral nutrients collected from the dust in the air. I know a lot of people have commented on my rainwater videos stating that, you know, as obviously the rain falls down, it collects dust from the sky and that can potentially be an issue. But if you're using it for irrigation, that can actually be a big pro. Rainwater also has the lowest salt content of natural fresh water sources. So it is a superior water source for plants. Need I say any more? There's so many benefits to it. And it's something that I'm so passionate about and I might even be more passionate about rainwater than I am for solar. Believe that. And one of the coolest things about rainwater is that it falls naturally from the sky. Now, there are certain areas, specifically in the United States, that people are like, oh, I can't capture rainwater here, it's legal. My advice to you, if you live in a state where it is, a, where it is illegal to do so, I would just move to a different place. I'm sure you could probably try to influence politicians and all that kind of crap. Uh, the government typically moves pretty slow. So I would just move to a place um, that allows you to do rainwater harvesting and gray water harvesting. Specifically in Arizona, I know all the rules here. Rainwater harvesting is not only legal, it is encouraged. And the same thing with gray water harvesting, it is not only legal, but also encouraged to do so because there is such a big water issue in Tucson and in Phoenix as well. And if you didn't know, the majority of water that goes to Phoenix and Tucson comes from the Colorado River, which borders um, California and Arizona. So it's pumped a number of hundred of miles, I forget, I forget the exact number, and up a huge amount of elevation change as well. So your water usage is mainly gonna be dictated by how many people are gonna be living in the home. Um, it's not dictated specifically on how big the home is, because a home that is you know, 3,000 square feet versus a home that is 500 square feet could essentially use the same amount of water. Uh, it just really depends on how many people are using it. So a big suggestion about cutting down your water usage is to use a composting toilet. I know they're kind of gross and disgusting, um, but if we had a flush toilet in the tiny house, it would be very difficult to, be, to, to do what we do. We'd have to make our rain roof bigger, we'd have to have more collection tanks, um, because you gotta imagine for every flush that might happen multiple times per day, you know, it's a gallon here, two gallons there, uh, depending on the toilet that you have. So it's a very significant amount of water. Pretty well, Hannah and I shower every single day, Actually, Hannah, do you want to come in here and talk about rainwater for a quick sec? Or how do you like living on rainwater? I like it. You like it? A lot. Women, women love the rainwater just as much as men do. It's really good for your hair and your clothes. And, and the plants too, the plants love it. Yeah, our plants grow really well. Awesome. But definitely like, I swear it's really good for your hair. Your hair and your clothes. Awesome. Because my hair is like. So she's got she's got really beautiful clean. she's got beautiful silk, silky long hair. Just feels really clean though. You know how like when I lived in when we lived in Tucson, our water was like it was so nasty mm -hmm. that I was trying to do 
back then I was trying to do like, um, what's it called? No poo, or you yeah. don't use shampoo or conditioner. But I, I just couldn't do it because the water was so bad, but I could probably do it here. She probably could. I don't Maybe you should test it out, but I don't think you need to. I'm not good. <laughs> okay, wait. So calculating how big of a system that you need for, for rainwater is really not that difficult. You just need to know some basic math and some basic formulas. Obviously, you need to know like the square footage of an, a, any catchment surfaces, um, but you also really need to know um, specifically how much rainfall the, that you get and throughout specific times of the year. So we need all the collection capacity that we have with all of our water tanks because there's many periods throughout the year where we don't get any measurable rain for like three or four months. It's crazy to think and it's really kind of a celebration out here when we do get rain, um, specifically at this time of year because we haven't really had a good amount of rain since December, January. So, so typically through March, April, May, and June, we don't really get a lot of rain. Uh, we might get a sprinkle here and there. Um, so we need to know that we're gonna have enough capacity based on our water usage, which you can actually calculate. There's gray water calculations in here. Um, we need to know that we can get through those lean months there um, and have enough water until we get our next set of monsoon storms. Hannah and I typically use around 800 to 1,000 gallons of water per month. I, don't, I can't remember the exact average that the, that the standard American household uses, but I'm sure it's probably about a, maybe a quarter or a fifth of the average um, that a standard home uses. Um, big part of that is obviously using a composting toilet. And another thing is, is that all of our water gets recycled back into the ground. So any of the shower water, any of our sink water, um, basically goes through our gray water pipes and waters trees. But let's go check out our water situation. So this is our rain roof that I built um, about three years ago. Still standing, still working, doing its job. And so the water from here filters into the gutter. And then there's two four inch pipes that are trenched in the ground and go to our main water tanks just right over there. So the water pipes come underground here. The rain roof is just right up there. Comes down in here comes up into our main first 2,500 gallon collection tank here, which is kind of like our sediment tank. So the water from here will overflow into that tank, and then these three tanks are connected underground. Water from the shed roof comes into this culvert cistern here. This tank right now, we've been using it to water uh, some of these trees and some of the other trees. Uh, this one's totally empty right now. The water from our washing machine in the shed comes down and irrigates this beautiful mulberry tree, which when we initially planted it, it uh, a couple of years ago, it was just a little stick. And uh, the last couple of years, we've gotten a ton of mulberries on it and they're just so good. So the water from the tiny house roof and from the awning goes into this big, uh, I think it's about 1600 gallon culvert cistern. And that tank there is about three quarters full right now. We thought that was almost empty, but we've actually got a lot more water in it than we thought. All the water from the tiny house, so from our sink and from our shower, comes out to our gray water basin here. So we've got a beautiful fig tree. We've got a, I think that's the apple tree. One of these is a cherry tree and a peach tree that grow well in this area. And then we've got a little desert willow that's growing. And our sunken basin here is doing pretty well. And it's got some squash growing there. Um, she's been growing things throughout the year. She had broccoli growing earlier this year. Um, and then our other raised garden beds have been doing all right. She just ripped out a lot of stuff and replanted things. Um, but then we've got some tomato plants there on those little culvert planters. So this water tank here, it's 2,500 gallons. It's pretty well almost full. And our other tank here is pretty well full as well. All of our water for irrigation and for in the house um, comes up. It gets pressurized just in a standard tank that you probably have uh, for a well house. It gets filtered through two different filters right here. Um, then we got our hot water heater. And for any water that we cook with or that we drink, it goes through the Berkey filter, which just sits on our countertop. And we just had this massive 28,000 gallon um, Aquamate water tank installed. Uh, the install video will be coming up very soon. And also the, uh, the pump house that I build and how we filter the water. It's gonna be a little bit different than how I did it up there. That's gonna be coming up very, very soon, so stay tuned and make sure you subscribe. So living on rainwater in the desert, can it be done? Absolutely. Uh, so the monsoon rains that we get over the next two months, um, that'll give us enough water to go our third full year of living entirely on rainwater. I would say that our system is probably a little bit oversized just because we have so much water left over. 
Um, but hey, it's better to have too much water and over design something than to not have enough water and have to get it like uh, trucked in, uh, which is very expensive to do. For a few thousand gallons of water, it's like $200. So it is, uh, it is not cheap to do so. Anyways guys, thanks so much for watching. Um, all the links and everything that I mentioned in the video will be in the description box and also in the comment section below. Thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you on the next video. Talk to you soon. Peace.